Today on Carpe Diem, how Montclair State University's Arts and Health Partnership is making a difference in our community. Hello and welcome to Carpe Diem. I'm Daniel Gerskis, Dean of the College of the Arts here at Montclair State University. Today we look at two community partners in our arts and health initiative, Atlantic Health System and the Montclair Art Museum. And for that, I'm pleased to welcome Maria Lupo and Leah Fox. Maria is a registered art therapist and the healing arts manager at Atlantic Health System. Leah is the director of the Vance Wall Art Education Center at the Montclair Art Museum. And welcome to you both. Thank you for having me. Prior to 2013, the university, the museum, and Atlantic Health each actively pursued arts and health initiatives on their own. So now we have this partnership with all three coming together in various ways to provide free programming for university students and employees, medical professionals and caregivers, and the general public. Maria, what are some examples of community programs in arts and health that the partnership has offered in its start phase? Well, the partnership really has been instrumental in expanding our community workshops and our educational programs. And in fact, we had an amazing uh, participation from MSU's Peak Performance. Liz Lerman, who did the extraordinary piece Healing Wars, actually came to our Morristown Medical Center and did a movement storytelling workshop with caregivers, chaplains, and the communities. So it really brought the theater right into the medical center. But on a, on a, a wider note, our annual conference, with, which the museum participates in, really has opened up the doors to well, that's the Well, that's a, an interesting segue for us. Uh, Leah, how did the Montclair Art Museum get involved in this? Yeah, uh, the museum was approached by Atlantic Health probably about four years ago now, mm -hmm. or coming up on four years ago, to be the venue for the Atlantic Health uh, Arts and Healing Conference. And we get, you know, steadily about 150 to 200 people every year for this day-long uh, conference. And it really brings together all these audiences of in healthcare, in the arts, together talking about different strategies and how the arts can help uh, individuals in a variety of ways. Maria, the Healing Arts <laughs> Program at AHS, uh, according to your literature, provides opportunities to experience health and well-being by bringing literary, performing, and visual arts to our patients, staff, and communities we serve. Uh, so how is the partnership with the university and the museum enhanced healing initiatives that were already up and running? Well, the healing initiative is already up and running. Well, uh, as, as a lone wolf, uh, we started our conference, but a very meager version of it in one of our facilities. Um, and with the growth of the museum and, and Montclair State, they were able to enhance the conference by being, bringing additional speakers in and then providing an excellent venue. So it really does expand the partnership, its reach, and gets a different sort of audience for us. And since we're on the subject of reach, Leah, uh, the museum has made it a priority to target um, outreach to certain underserved groups. An example of that is the creating, <coughs> excuse me, the Creative Aging Initiative uh, aimed at older adults living with dementia as well as uh, their caregivers. Yeah. From your perspective, what's the effect of this initiative on both the patient and the caregiver? Sure, that's a great question and a really important one. Uh, we have our Creative Aging Initiative that's been happening. We kind of grew out of this conference, demonstrating a need in the community. And for a couple of years now, we offer uh, several different types of monthly programs for uh, individuals with uh, dementia or Alzheimer's and their caregivers uh, equally. And what and happens with that is that uh, these individuals in, in small groups spend time in the galleries looking at works of art, uh, works of art that tell a narrative that can help people build on their 
prior life experience in their long-term memory and then have uh, a studio experience as well where everyone is really, the, lev the playing field is really leveled. <clears throat> People are making art together. There's no right or wrong way of making art or looking at art. So it really takes the relationship from what can often be uh, a, a child taking care of their parent and having it be a health care relationship to just enjoying each other's company and learning from each other. Uh, so it, it really uh, helps build those relationships in a different way. And typically how many people are involved in any one of these events? Sure. Uh, we like to keep the group small so there's always a volunteer docent leading a tour and an educator leading the art project. We have plenty of volunteers, so there's always a almost a one-on-one -on -one support for people who are coming to the program. And you know, I think if we have you know between five and fifteen people at a program, that's just perfect uh, because it really allows everyone to feel comfortable. And do you have a sense of which communities <laughs> they come from? They really come from all around. Certainly Montclair, uh, but we do, uh, you know, with those programs and others, have partnerships around Essex County and, and northern New Jersey. Maria, are there some interesting examples of Atlantic Health's creative art therapists benefiting from collaborating with outside institutions? And yes, collaboration is really helps broaden the field, and in particular with Montclair State, we take in the interns in music therapy, interns in the creative arts, and they actually function as art ambassadors and, and work at the bedside to help patients. So, so that really does, plus it also give, affords us other venues. And, and again, that, that reach for us is, is, it gets larger and larger with the other venues because sometimes people, when they're not actually in treatment, would prefer not to be in a medical setting. So it's mm -hmm. excellent to have the museum. And of course, when we look down the road, research is always a possibility with strengthening the creative arts and how they really enhance health. And about how many creative arts therapists do you employ? Gosh, we, we probably employ full-time about 15, which is I always want to see it grow, but in various fields, movement, music, art therapy, and um, they serve as mentors to the oncoming interns. And across how many institutions? Well, we have four medical centers, plus we have a rehab center, which um, involves art therapy and music therapy for stroke patients. And to also talk about the creative aging aspect, we do a program called Healing Arts Sampler, which is geared towards the Alzheimer's dementia patient. And it's um, three modules, four weeks of storytelling, four weeks of music therapy, and four weeks of art therapy. So that rounds out the program. Well, since we're on the topic of collaboration, in November 2014, the annual Healing Arts Conference took place at the Montclair Art Museum. The theme was Growing Up Autism. Students from MSU School of Communication and Media captured the event. Here's a quick look at the conference. Atlantic Health has been partnering with Montclair State University in a series of conferences to bring together the arts and healthcare communities. Together with the Montclair Art Museum, they sponsored Growing Up Autism, a conference to shed light on how the creative arts plays a vital role in healing. We think of autism in this limiting way and sometimes inadvertently contribute to the difficulties a person has with autism. I think that teaching autistic kids is very much like teaching any, any child, except sometimes in the early stages the younger children may be having trouble coordinating uh, where their eyes are going, where their hands are going. Sometimes the eyes are going this way and their hands are going that way. I try different things, try to be flexible, and what kicks in, you know, that's what I go with. Leon Morden's son is diagnosed with Down syndrome as well as autism. He attended this Healing Arts Coalition conference in hopes to find an organization that may provide his son a more active lifestyle, or how he likes to call it, keeping him hip. Hip meaning keeping him, keeping him happy, independent, and productive. So I'm always looking for various tools. And in this particular case for today, I'm looking at how art might help his life. 
The conference welcomed many guests to discuss therapy through the creative arts, including artist Justin Kanha. In t- in th- I, th- I think um, in 2011, I graduated from sel- transition class at Salvation Army. One of the ways he um, you know, supports, he pays half the rent, I pay half the rent, um, and uh, he supports himself in large part through these uh, pet portraits, which um, if you want one, you know, he'll make it for you, um, and they're all really good. Autistic people can be very creative and have many gifts to offer. It is essential to create a culture of possibilities through the arts so that people living with autism can show their strengths. So we saw Justin Kunha, and I'm sorry, Justin Kanha, a visual artist living with autism. He's created a niche for himself uh, with, as an illustrator of pets. Maria, can you talk about the value of his art on all levels? Uh, Justin is art has so many different levels, but mainly Justin, in his own right, is a very talented artist, and one can see that looking at his work. But with what message Justin brings to everyone, and especially the autistic community, is with everyone, let's just focus on abilities. Let's let's tap into our strengths and bring them forward. And Justin's ability to support himself through his work is huge. And also, he's very engaging with an audience. He actually gave a mini drawing instruction to the group, and it was very, it was it was just a, a precious experience. So there's another conference coming up. Uh, the theme this time around is non-traditional approaches to arts and healing. Uh, Leah, can you share an example or two of the methods? Absolutely. Um, we have a great lineup of a whole variety of different strategies that will be uh, you know, presented during this time. Uh, some of our staff in the education department at the Montclair Art Museum will be talking about uh, multi-generational programming. Again, thinking about this audience of uh, people with dementia, but not only that audience. We're going to focus on uh, a great partnership that we have called Bridges. And it's with a, a rehabilitation uh, care facility or residence in uh, Cedar Grove, but in partnership with seventh and eighth graders who self-apply for to participate in this program. So uh, it's a multi-week program where uh, these young adults and the seniors get together uh, at the museum and they're you know looking at artwork in the galleries, making art, doing storytelling, other forms of creative expression. And, you know, I think for the uh, students, this is a great opportunity for them to really uh, understand the full lives of their elders, develop a stronger appreciation and respect for this community. And then, you know, for the older adults, it's just so wonderful to be around, you know, young, fresh eyes on life. And uh, the results are really just, you know, wonderful experiences for everyone. That's great. Um, And Maria, what speakers should we look forward to hearing? Well, this, I'm really excited about the lineup, but I I really want to first mention a highlight of every conference at the museum is at the end, the museum gives free docent tours. So that's exceptional. But this year's lineup is is really different. Uh, Besides the um, aging initiatives on the part of the museum, we have Alec Gross. He is going to do a community group song. So we're going to leave the event with actually a song that the whole group will participate in. So we have that. We, we're bringing back Madeline Marshall, who's a movement therapist at um, Atlantic Health. And she does work with folks who have limited ability or, or are confined to a chair all day. So she's going to guide us through a movement piece. And we also have Real Beauty Uncovered, which is exceptional because it was an art exhibition. We have a panel built around it about what really beauty is and what authentic beauty is. And in fact, that show, which informed me to actually call them in as a panel, was up on exhibit at Montclair yes, State. Yes, it was. So we're looking forward to that. And then the real difference this year will be we're going to have conversation tables. So if any of the other selections you're not so sure about, we are going to have about seven to 10 tables 
ranging from narrative medicine, which is storytelling, creative placemaking, an art therapy experiential, music therapy. So there's really something for everyone built in this conference. So these conferences are free, mm -hmm. open to the public. Are there particular groups, you listed quite a few, but are there particular groups, say caregivers and art therapists, that these conferences aim to serve? Well, the conference really fulfills a mission on very many levels. So if we look at the professional therapist, even beyond art therapist or an art therapist, it, ge it gives the opportunity to professionally network and look at other modalities. Well, maybe I can incorporate storytelling in. I'm an art therapist. But then when we look at the public, which is also invited, this field is really up and coming and strong. It gives them an overview and a tip off what are the community, re community resources and care caregiver experiences for them. And then, of course, we never leave out the student who, who may at one point be making a career choice, may want to volunteer. And again, they can also get the overview and network with professionals. Leah, uh, an art museum is obviously um, a very special place. Why is it important that events like the Healing Arts Conference take place mm -hmm. at any museum, but specifically the Montclair yeah, Art Museum? Yeah, that's a really great question. And I think uh, the way I'd respond to this maybe 10 years ago is very different than today because over the past several years, museums have really become involved in arts and healing on a national uh, level. There are so many museums that really are seeing the opportunities and the priority to think about uh, audiences, uh, you know, we've been talking about Alzheimer's and dementia or people with disabilities or healing opportunities. And so museums have really developed some really incredible standards and networks around this. So for the Montclair Art Museum, certainly uh, knowing that all of these services are are happening around the community, we wanted to really, uh, we felt like there was a really strong uh, overlap in our missions because the art museum has a really strong commitment to providing inclusive and diverse experiences, welcoming uh, perspectives on the collection and exhibitions from a wide variety of people, and that includes uh, people with disabilities, people who are on some level of the healing perspective. Uh, so we really made this uh, partnership a priority and it's just been fantastic for everyone all around. And previously there was a tour of the museum that was included as part of the conference. Yes. Uh, you spoke a little bit about it, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about how access to the collection influences the conference and the conference right. attendees. So as Maria had mentioned, there's a a tour at the end of each conference and what's great about this tour is it's not only an art historical tour going through the collection but it's really an opportunity for us to model to the participants what engagement can look like with the public so we're having dialogue we're asking open-ended questions we're you know telling our own personal stories as it relates to what we see in works of art so uh, we really try to develop a sense of community that we want to model in that conference experience which is the same thing that we would be doing for a group of people at the museum and switching gears a little mm -hmm. bit on this, uh, Professor Lupo, <laughs> you, uh, you've taught at Montclair State recently. Uh, um, what did you teach? How did it go? What were the students like? Well, it, first of all, it was a tremendous experience to be able to put that hat or that role back on. Um, it, was a, it was for arts and healthcare communication. So people came into the course with diverse backgrounds. Uh, one student was a very established type professional photographer and another person was curious. But what the class size afforded me here was to really individualize their projects. So we could work on projects that were meaningful to them and would put them further along in their career development. But the fact of having a professor also be on staff at AHS, I pulled in some ringers. I pulled in professionals in the field that could address specifically their discipline and how it works in the real world and of course we've had we had benefits of having interns from that class mm -hmm. visit Atlantic Health. And what sort of majors were attracted to the course do you know? Uh, 
art majors, graphic design, design majors, uh, a photographer, um, and we were actually pulling through the undecided, which was nice, nice, and, and communications majors. Well, that's a good, a good range. Mm -hmm. uh, Leah, in addition to the Creative Aging Initiative, um, and what are other arts and health programming uh, initiatives that the, that the museum is offering to the right, community? Right. I think in the broadest sense, I think visiting a museum and participating in programs is certainly a, a healing experience for all of us. But uh, thinking specifically about this conversation here today, there are a couple of other things that uh, we do. And one is, uh, you know, not only do we have the programs in the galleries that we talked about, but we also have the Yard School of Art, which is a studio program at the museum and we offer a wide variety of programs, uh, studio programs there for all ages from four up through, you know, older adults. So any afternoon that you come by, you can see uh, children of all abilities, uh, you know, whether in the ceramic studio or creating art, but then you can also see older adults in a watercolor class, you know, painting a still life, or in a drawing class working from, uh, drawing from a, a live model. So there are a whole variety of, of programs that we offer that serve this audience. And then extending beyond the physical structure of the museum, we have a great art truck that goes out around the community uh, the art truck is so exciting. It's a kind of a repurposed ice cream truck that is decorated and colorful and goes to uh, social service organizations and fairs and parks and festivals and also to senior centers. Uh, it's really available to be, if you call the museum and schedule in advance, we can make every effort to be at your program. And that's bringing, Available for weddings? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we haven't had that opportunity yet, but that would be so much fun. So yes, I will say that we could be available for weddings. Uh, and that's a great time where people really roll their sleeves up and get engaged and create some really fun uh, projects and sometimes they're larger community projects too. Oh, that sounds terrific. Yeah, really so, cool. Um, the future of the collaboration between the university, the museum, uh, the Atlantic Health System. Uh, what new ways do you see the institutions working together as we move forward? Well, well, we have just launched the Arts and Health Certificate Program, which is amazing because it's very new in its field and very innovative. And that will definitely involve all three organizations and with, with the future idea of building upon it. But, but I also see the collaboration informing the certificate in a way that uh, the museum will serve as a really great community outreach and resource, and also the idea of research. Research in the field of the creative art therapies is needed because we all have anecdotal stories of how it feels good, we know it's good, and there are studies that are evidence-based that it works, but we want to build on that. We want to make that case. And uh, I know one in particular has to do with our dancers mm -hmm. uh, and the physical therapists that they've been working with. Could you just talk about that a little bit? Yes, we have, um, we have a, an Atlantic Health physical therapist placed up here to work with the dancers. And besides the initial assessment that she was doing last spring, she's actually doing Pilates for dancers. So the idea is, Yes, engage in the arts and be a dancer, but we, want, we do not want those physical injury, injuries. We want to prevent them, but we're also monitoring it with surveys, and we're building a study around it to make the case that this is essential for every program to ensure the health of its students. So, so we like to serve, serve the larger model and, and really be a national program to roll this out. And do you see other research projects coming out of uh, this collaboration in the arts and health? Yes, absolutely. We are working on a few. There's, uh, we're, we're trying to team up with one of our aging programs and the researchers from Montclair State to assess that seniors involved in our new vitality program, are the outcomes better? Are they seeking help? 
Do they understand ways to get help through the system? And also cater to the fact that maybe they're not as savvy with the social media. But I, I kind of take that back because I think they really are. But engage them in very many ways to, and how can we build on that? So yes, we are looking at everything. Uh, Leah, any thoughts about the museum and the partnership? Oh, I'm, we're very excited about this certificate program in particular, and I think this is a great opportunity for us to just see, you know, where our missions connect and overlap, and I would love for the museum to be a laboratory for uh, the, the students in this program, and we can certainly figure out a way to make that kind of thing happen. Uh, but another great thing that's happening at the museum uh, right now, which I think just makes this whole opportunity conversation today just perfect timing is that we recently launched the Vance Wall Art Education Center at the museum and uh, what that allows us is an opportunity to really examine our museum programs, studio programs, their intersection uh, with each other but with our galleries and with the community and really thinking about the great work that we're already doing, how we can take that to the next level and really address some of these needs in the community uh, such as uh, arts and healing and university collaborations. So uh, I think you'll see a lot more great things to come from the Vance Wall Art Education Center at the Montclair Art Museum. Well, I just want to make sure that people know that the Arts and Health Certificate Program is a five course sequence that um, and uh, students can take one or all. We would like them to take all. It can be completed in a year as well. So for more information about the Arts and Health Partnership in Healing Arts, you can visit www.AtlanticHealth.org slash Healing Arts. To learn more about the Montclair Art Museum, visit www.MontclairArtMuseum.org. And for information about this or any other edition of Carpe Diem, you can write to us at Carpe Diem at mail.montclair.edu or give us a call at 973-655-5158. Maria, Leah, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you for joining us and thank you for joining us. For Carpe Diem, I'm Daniel Gerskis. Thanks for watching.